Detective Recapped here. Today, I'm going to explain a crime mystery film called, Seven. Spoilers ahead. Watch out and take care. Soon to be retiree Detective Lieutenant William Somerset is called to a crime scene, where a wife shot her husband dead. As Somerset investigates the place, he asks Detective Taylor if the couple's kid saw the incident, which surprises the detective. Taylor boldly tells Somerset how happy their colleagues will be once he retires, saying he always asks weird questions. It doesn't matter whether the kid has seen it or not since his father is already dead. While talking, newly transferred Detective Mills arrives and introduces himself to Somerset. Though they're assigned to be partners, the two don't see each other eye to eye, especially with the younger Mills' impatient and hot-headed personality. With seven days remaining until his retirement, Somerset reminds Mills that he'll be the one calling the shots between the two of them. Somerset and Mills officially start working as partners on a rainy Monday. The responding officer at the crime scene tells them that nothing has been touched, adding that the victim has had his face in a plate of spaghetti for 45 minutes already. Confused, Mills asks the officer why the victim's vital signs haven't been checked, and the irritated officer points out that the victim is obviously dead. Somerset and Mills enter the victim's filthy residence, and inside, they see insects everywhere, along with plenty of canned spaghetti sauces on the shelf. The victim, an extremely obese man, sits on a chair with his hands and feet bound while his face buried in his food. Under the table, Mills sees a bucket of the victim's vomit. Somerset asks if there's blood in it, but Mills replies that he didn't see any. He then inquires if Somerset thinks it's poison, but before Somerset could answer, the examiner arrives. While the doctor examines the victim, Somerset orders Mills to help the officers question the neighbors, and although he's clearly annoyed, Mills complies. In the morgue, the coroner tells Somerset and Mills that the victim has been dead for a long time, and it was not because of poison. The coroner tries explaining the cause of death, and putting it simply, Somerset surmises the victim died from eating until he burst. Somerset then asks how the victim got his bruises on his head, but the coroner tells him that he hasn't figured that out yet. Somerset assumes it was from a gun pressed to his head, which the coroner deems a possibility if it was pushed hard enough. Looking closely at the victim's head, Mills announces that they have a case of homicide. Back at the station, Somerset, Mills, and the police captain talk about the victim's death. Somerset reads the autopsy report, saying the killer took his time in making the victim suffer by forcing him to keep eating. According to the findings, it could have gone on for 12 hours. The victim's throat was also swollen, likely from the strain and effort, and when he passed out, the killer kicked him, making him burst and die. When Somerset tells them that the killer's actions could have a meaning, the captain dismisses his idea. Somerset requests for reassignment, surprising both the captain and Mills. He says he doesn't want that case to be his last and that it's too soon for a young detective like Mills. However, the captain rejects his request since there's no one else to take the case for them. With his ego hurt, Mills asks the captain to just give him the case and let Somerset go, but the captain rejects this, too, saying that he's putting Mills on something else. On Tuesday, reporters flock to the second crime scene. When Mills arrives, he finds the forensic experts going through the place. With nothing to report yet, Mills instructs the guys to have a break while he examines the scene. He stands in the middle of the room, looking at the word greed written on the floor in blood. On the office table, he studies a woman's photograph with circles drawn around her eyes using blood. At the precinct, the captain informs Somerset that criminal defense attorney Eli Gould has been murdered. He reports that someone broke into the attorney's apartment that morning, bled him to death, and wrote the word greed on the floor, piquing the detective's interest. The captain also says that Mills is leading the investigation, and as they talk, he tells Somerset that he doesn't think the detective is actually going to quit. Before the captain goes, he leaves Somerset a small glass containing tiny pieces of plastic, which, according to the coroner, were fed to the first victim. Somerset returns to the obese man's house, looking for any clue they might have missed. Sure enough, he notices some drag marks on the floor, matching the plastic material fed to the victim. Somerset moves the refrigerator from its place, and he sees the word gluttony written in grease on the wall along with a note. He takes it back to the station and gives it to their captain, saying the note is a line from Milton's poem, Paradise Lost. The captain tells him that he's confused, so Somerset explains that there are seven deadly sins and that the first two cases represent gluttony and greed. The other five are sloth, wrath, pride, lust, and envy, and he concludes that they can expect five more cases like the other two. Somerset then walks away and tells the captain that he can't be involved in them. To gain more insight into the cases, Somerset goes to the library to read books like Dante Alighieri's Divine Comedy and Geoffrey Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. He makes a list of books for Mills which he believes might be useful for solving this. Meanwhile, Mills goes through the evidence they have and learns that the second victim was forced to mutilate himself. As Somerset finishes his research, he photocopies some pages from the books and places them on Mills' table. On Wednesday, Mills' wife, Tracy, calls the station and invites Somerset for dinner at their apartment. While eating, Tracy asks Somerset why he isn't married, and he answers that he was once close to doing it, but it never happened. The three have a few laughs, and after dinner, Somerset and Mills start reviewing all the evidence they have. Through the pictures and reports, Somerset learns that Eli Gould was bound with his right arm free and was forced to take off a pound of flesh from his body before it was placed on a scale. As they continue to go through the evidence, Somerset concludes that the killer is preaching, saying the seven deadly sins were used in medieval sermons. 
He also adds that the murders are like forced attrition, where one regrets his sins but not because he loves God. Before he could forget Gould's wife, Mills shows her photo to Somerset, saying she might have seen something. However, Somerset says that it may not be about something she's seen, but something she's supposed to see but hasn't been given a chance. To get some answers, Somerset and Mills go to see Mrs. Gould. They give her photographs from the crime scene, asking if she can see anything that is out of place. Although she's upset and crying, Mrs. Gould manages to point out that the painting in one of the pictures is upside down. Wasting no time, Somerset and Mills go to Eli Gould's place to remove the said painting from the wall. Unfortunately, they aren't able to find anything from the painting, which pisses Mills off. Not about to give up yet, Somerset dusts the wall from where they took off the painting and finds a set of fingerprints. In the lab, the forensic analyst shows Somerset and Mills that the fingerprints from the wall spell the words, help me. The analyst also tells the detectives that they are definitely not the victims, but he reminds them that finding a match for the print might take at least three days. Thursday comes, and the detectives finally get a match. During their police briefing, the captain tells everyone that their suspect goes by the name of Victor, but his real name is Theodore Allen. He says Victor has a long history of mental illness and has spent some time in prison. However, he was able to get out because of his lawyer, Eli Gould. As the captain mobilizes his men to get Victor, Somerset and Mills doubt that Victor is their guy. Somerset says that he believes the real killer to have more purpose. At Victor's place, the cops find the house filled with air freshener. In the bedroom, a scraggly man covered with wounds and bed sores is strapped to the bed, and the word sloth is written on the wall. While everyone tries to make sense of what they're seeing, Mills finds a box with Victor's stool, urine, fingernail, and hair sample. They also see Victor's pictures inside the box, with one taken from a year ago. As if the scene isn't gruesome enough, Victor suddenly gasps for air, making everyone jump out of their skin. Victor is taken to the hospital, while Somerset and Mills stay behind to talk about the killer. As they do, a photographer suddenly shows up and takes a photo of the two detectives. Infuriated, Mills tells him to leave, but the photographer says he has a right to be there. In response, Mills gets rid of him by smashing his camera. The photographer leaves in anger, warning Mills that he's got their pictures. Mills taunts the photographer by spelling his name for him, and as he turns to face Somerset, he asks him how the photographers get there so quickly. Somerset replies that photographers pay police for information and that they pay well. In the hospital, the doctor tells Somerset and Mills that Victor has been immobilized for a year. His blood test shows various drugs in his system, which includes an antibiotic to keep the bed sores from infecting. Unfortunately for the detectives, Victor won't be able to speak since he chewed off his tongue long ago. One night, Tracy calls Somerset and asks him to meet her the following day. On Friday morning, Tracy and Somerset meet up at a diner, and she tells him that she's pregnant. Surprised, Somerset suggests that he's unsure if he's the right person to talk to about it. Tracy tells him that she hates their city, and Somerset shares with her how he got his girlfriend pregnant a long time ago. He recounts how scared he was to raise a baby at that time, so he told his girlfriend that he didn't want it until he eventually wore her down. Somerset advises Tracy that if she's not keeping her baby, then she shouldn't tell Mills that she's pregnant. However, he adds that if she decides to keep the baby, then she should spoil the kid every chance she gets. Tracy then thanks Somerset before he goes back to the precinct. Back at the station, Somerset and Mills learn that there was an envelope of cash in Victor's office mailbox the first of every month. According to the landlord, Victor has never complained about anything, and no one has ever complained about him either. Mills gets impatient, asking why they're waiting for the killer to strike again instead of looking for him. Somerset once again analyzes the evidence they have, observing that the killer has to be methodical and very patient to sever Victor's hand, plant his fingerprints at the crime scene, all while keeping him bound for a whole year. But to Mills, the killer is just some crazy man who happens to have a library card. Somerset then gets the idea of going to the library to make a list of books related to the seven deadly sins, trying to figure out what books the killer finds interesting. After making the list, Somerset and Mills eat at a pizza parlor, where they meet a man who discreetly takes the list and some cash from Somerset. Before the man leaves, he tells them to meet him in an hour. Since he's not in the know about who the man is, Mills sulks, and that's when Somerset tells him that that man is his friend from the bureau. Somerset says the FBI has been hooked into the library system to monitor reading habits. He then adds that some books are flagged, and if anyone checks out a flagged book, he'll have his library records fed into the FBI's computers. Best of all, it's not possible to get a library card without an ID and a current phone bill. So, if they want to know who's reading books like Purgatory or Paradise Lost, the FBI computers will tell them. After an hour, the man from the bureau meets up with them at a barbershop and hands them a list of books that a certain Jonathan Doe has checked out. Somerset and Mills go to his place and knock on his door, but there is no answer. Suddenly, a man arrives on the other end of the hallway and starts shooting at them. Mills goes after him, injuring himself in the process. As he chases the guy in a narrow street, Mills decides to search a truck, thinking the suspect might be there. While doing so, the man hiding on top of the truck hits Mills in the head with a tire iron, leaving him defenseless. As Mills tries to crawl and reach for his gun, the suspect gets to it first and points it to his head, and while Somerset almost catches them, the man gets to run away once more. Somerset and Mills go back to the suspect's apartment, and Mills intends to enter his place without a warrant. Somerset tries reasoning that they need a probable cause first. 
He stresses that they need a reason to knock on that door to get a warrant, but being injured and impatient, Mills just kicks the door open. With some cash, the two detectives pay a woman to be their witness, instructing her to tell the cops that the man from that apartment kept going out during the time of the murders, prompting her to call Somerset. Now that they're free to search the suspect's place, Somerset and Mills go inside his apartment and find dozens of evidence linking him to killings, including cans of spaghetti sauce and Victor's severed hand. In one of the rooms, Mills finds photographs of the killer's victims, while in another one, Somerset finds a notebook with details about the seven deadly sins. In the bathroom, Mills finds his photographs and calls Somerset, saying John Doe, the killer, is the photographer from the third victim staircase days ago. As everyone is looking for more evidence, the phone in John Doe's house starts ringing, and Mills answers it. He tells Mills that he admires the detectives, saying he doesn't know how they were able to find him. He then comments that he needs to readjust his schedule due to the day's setback. While they talk, Somerset records their conversation, and the killer tells Mills that he feels like he should be saying more, but he doesn't want to ruin the surprise before ending the call. When Somerset and Mills return to reviewing their newly acquired evidence, they wonder who the blonde woman is in one of John Doe's photos. On Saturday, Somerset and Mills use a receipt from John Doe's house, which leads them to a leather repair and restoration shop. The owner shows them what John has ordered, and they suddenly receive a call from the cops, reporting that the blonde from the picture has been found. They find her dead in a small hotel, violated with a custom-made blade strap on by a man who claims an armed guy forced him to do it. The following day is a Sunday, and John Doe calls 911, confessing that he's done it again. Somerset and Mills go to the crime scene, where they find a dead woman on the bed with a bottle of sleeping pills glued to one hand and a telephone glued to the other. The woman's face was mutilated and bandaged, and the word pride is written on the wall. Somerset believes that the killer made her choose between calling for help and living with a disfigured face or killing herself. Evidently, the woman chose the latter option, embodying the sin of pride. At the station, John Doe suddenly surrenders himself while still wearing a bloody shirt. His fingers are also bloody since he's been removing the skin on them to avoid leaving his fingerprints anywhere. According to John Doe's lawyer, he has two more bodies hidden away. He wants to take Somerset and Mills, just the two of them, to the location where he's buried the bodies at 6 o'clock that day. He also says that if the detectives do not accept the offer, then those bodies will never be found and that he will plead insanity. However, if they comply, he will immediately sign a full confession and plead guilty. Despite their initial reluctance, they agree to the given terms. Wearing a wire to record their conversation, Somerset and Mills ride with John to the secret location of the dead bodies. During the ride, John shows no remorse for his crimes, saying he's setting an example and that his victims were not innocent people. He also adds that Mills should be thanking him since he will be remembered after that case. With a chopper following them, Somerset and Mills continue taking John to the deserted location where he claims to have buried his victims. Suddenly, a van arrives, and while Mills points a gun at John's head to keep him in place, Somerset runs to the road to check who the driver is. As soon as he stops the van, Somerset demands the driver to step out, and the driver tells him that he has a package for Mills. The driver says some guy paid him to deliver the package there at precisely 7 o'clock. Somerset takes the box and tells the driver to leave on foot, and when he opens the package, he is horrified by what's inside. Somerset then yells to Mills to step away from John. As Mills is trying to listen to Somerset, John tells him how much he admires Tracy. He says he visited Mills' house that morning and took Tracy's head as a souvenir because he envies Mills' normal life. While John is provoking Mills, Somerset finally gets to where they are and asks Mills to get rid of his gun. Unfazed, Mills demands Somerset to tell him what's in the box, and Somerset tells Mills that John wants to be killed by him. Still, John continues to goad Mills, saying that Tracy begged for her life and her babies, shocking Mills since he doesn't know about her pregnancy. With tears in his eyes, Mills shoots John in the head. Finally, John's self-proclaimed masterpiece comes into completion with Mills representing wrath while John himself represents envy. Mills is then taken into custody, and as the captain asks Somerset where he's going to be, he replies that he'll be around. Somerset leaves, and he thinks back to Ernest Hemingway's words, the world is a fine place and worth fighting for. Somerset agrees with the second part. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications. And leave a like it really helps the channel out. Thank you for watching.